Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special episode of the Animal Care Systems webinar series. I'm your host, Austin Carell. Before we begin, we first thank ALAS for helping to distribute the webinars through the ACE community, and we thank the other participating companies. Today's presenter is Ms. Julie Squires. Ms. Squires obtained her compassion fatigue specialization at the Traumatology Institute and has more than 25 years of experience in the veterinary industry as a technician and hospital administrator. Ms. Squires is an international speaker and coach at Rekindle Solutions. She is an expert in life coaching and regularly presents to national audiences and consults within the pharmaceutical, life sciences, and veterinary industries. Animal Care Systems is pleased to host Ms. Squires' webinar today. The title of her seminar is Going Beyond Compassion Fatigue. If you have a question for Ms. Squires, please use the question pane in the control panel. and We will answer as many questions as we can after the seminar. Ms. Squires, I turn the audience to you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you for having me. This is a thrill, absolute thrill. And I see there's lots of people here. And uh, that makes me even more thrilled to know that there's so many people who are interested in this topic, which clearly is uh, of great importance to me. So let's get going. We don't have a lot of time and I've got a lot of information to share with you. So I will tell you that I have a handout that's available. I'll tell you how to get that at the end. So sit back, relax, you know, um, to the best of your ability, close down all the things that might distract you. And like was already described, I have worked in veterinary medicine for a very long time, and it was where I first was exposed to compassion fatigue. It was also where I first saw the tragic uh, results of compassion fatigue as it related to veterinarians and suicide. And essentially that is what got me inspired and motivated to do the work that I do now. And I am beyond blessed to do the work that I do now. And I'm beyond blessed to work with the lab animal community who is very near and dear to my heart. So um, yes, I am certified in compassion fatigue. I'm a life coach. I'm gonna bring all of those things to you today. And I love all things that start with P like pugs and pigs and peanut butter, just to name a few. And that's my friend, Sister Mary Francis in the picture. And here's my family. Um, we, uh, our kids have fur <laughs> around here, and that's my husband, John. And we live in upstate New York, so uh, we are about 90 miles outside of New York City. And um, it, is, it is an interesting time for us all, wherever you are in the country, in the world, I, uh, I'm with you in, in spirit for sure. So today, of course, I wanna talk a little bit about not just what compassion fatigue is, because I'm guessing you already know about that, but I don't know if you've been on a webinar with me before, so I wanna make sure I just sort of lay the foundations for that, but then we will talk about what do we do about compassion fatigue. And I know that's pretty much probably why you came to this webinar. So like I start every talk, we will start with this quote from Dr. Rachel Remen, and she said this, she said that the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not have it affect us is as unrealistic as expecting to walk through water and not getting wet. So of course we will be affected by the work that we do. Of course we will be affected by what we witness, by what we're bearing witness to, by the things that uh, we are asked to do, especially what's happening right now with the COVID-19 situation. And if you're being asked to cull healthy populations of animals, um, of course, how are we supposed to get through that unscathed, right? And I'm going to help you with some of those things for sure. That's my intention today. So let's start at the beginning. What is compassion fatigue? Well, I'm pretty sure you can school me on compassion fatigue. I know what it is, uh, and I'm pretty sure you know what it is too. But there are also maybe people on this webinar that don't totally understand it because their role within the organization doesn't put them in quote unquote harm's way. And I wanna make sure that we really ground ourselves in understanding what this is. So um, essentially, if we were to look at our professional quality of life, there's two sides to it. The right-hand side is the compassion fatigue side, the negative consequences of the work, the negative aspects of the work. And then the left-hand side is the positive. And you'll notice they actually are in equal proportion. But we'll start with what is compassion fatigue. And the way that I like to describe compassion fatigue is that it really is a combination 
of emotional, physical, psychological, and spiritual exhaustion and depletion that happens when we are in the presence of other beings, and that could be animals, people, or plants that are exhibiting some kind of distress, some kind of pain, suffering, that could be physical pain, emotional pain, all of the above. That is compassion fatigue. Again, we are being secondarily traumatized. It is, there is a trauma component to compassion fatigue. We are being traumatized by witnessing the pain and suffering of another. That is compassion fatigue. And it has many things that contribute to it. Um, again, listed on the slide, you can see a whole bunch of things that can contribute to it. And this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. And for sure, what is going on as we are all trying to navigate COVID-19 right now, um, that is also contributing to it. Like I mentioned before, having to euthanize healthy populations of animals um, is, would definitely be a contributor. But euthanasia in general, even when we're euthanizing animals at the end of their study, um, of course, that is contributing to compassion fatigue. And the nature of our research and the people we're working alongside of, and if we are also feeling the effects of burnout, which many of you may also be feeling right now, and if there's any work-related trauma component, all of those things are factoring in. And one of the things that I wanna mention about trauma is that trauma is in the eye of the beholder. What is traumatic to one person may not be traumatic to another. And we really have to understand that and keep an open mind that just because something doesn't bother us doesn't mean it may not bother somebody else. So when I've asked the lab animal community before, like what's difficult about your work, there are very consistent things that come up time and time and time and time again. So one of the things, or many of the things that come up uh, often is not feeling like they have enough time. That they're always being rushed, that you know the, the workload is so intense that they're not able to give the care that they want. Um, animal suffering not having a good outlet in a building to actually decompress. And I want to stop for a moment because this is a really important point. I know many of our organizations, institutions, facilities are kind of going to this open space, um, Google-like, um, you know, uh, la um, um, landscape, if you will, for lack of a better word. And while that's wonderful on one hand, it is not wonderful for people who are trying to deal with their emotions. When we're trying to deal with our emotions, we actually need a safe, quiet place where perhaps we need to be alone. And I have worked in some organizations where they have these little pods where people can actually reserve them and have some quiet time by themselves. But I do think it's important to think about where is a place where people can go if this is an extremely emotional time. Maybe this is, um, again, uh, the end of a study and you know we're euthanizing lots of animals and people's emotions are very raw, like is there a place for people to go where they can just be with themselves and be with their emotions for a few moments even? Other things that come up, um, studies that have to be repeated due to mistakes, not getting to know the animals like we want to. This last point comes up over and over and over again and I'm gonna guess I have a variety of roles and responsibilities on the line so I want to make this point. Um, this last, this last point here about leadership to understand lab animals, respect, and the importance of animal care staff, and that they require support. It's very easy to get siloed in this work, and I want to really, really, really beg and plead with those of you that do not interact regularly with animals to connect with and engage with those that do so you can truly understand what it is that they are going through, what their challenges are, what their obstacles are and what it is like to be in their shoes because if we don't understand that we start to lose compassion for people and we start to make judgments about people and we lose the ability to actually support and help people and we really need to be supporting and helping each other no matter what your role is other things that come up being understaffed under equipped and therefore we're having to rush and sometimes that leads to quote unquote risky behavior Euthanizing animals that maybe you've known for a long period of time. Handling coworkers and their emotions and not knowing what to do to help people. And then again, of course, comes up again is um, uh, euthanasia. Now, what's interesting about compassion fatigue is it looks different in everybody and that makes it hard to recognize in somebody. It might make it hard, you know, you might exhibit 
signs of compassion fatigue very differently than somebody that you work alongside of. And therefore, you may start to not understand where they're coming from, or you may start to, again, either think that they don't care, which is a, which is a very dangerous thought to have when we start going down the road that other people don't care. It's just not a helpful thought, and it is a thought. I'm gonna teach you about thoughts today. Um, but as you can see, like there's a whole list here of, of, of different uh, signs of compassion fatigue. And might I say, compassion fatigue is not a mental illness. It's a set of signs and symptoms. And like I said, looks different in everyone. And even in ourselves, we might exhibit it differently at the beginning of our career than we do in the middle of our career than we do at the end of our career. And to take that a step further, of course, there's an impact on the organization, right? If all of our teams, if our departments are struggling with compassion fatigue and have high levels of it, then of course that impacts the science, you better believe it. It could impact the quality of the results that we're getting. It can impact um, you know, our quality control. It can impact morale, teamwork, all of that. So I love that we're having this discussion today because we can't ever fix anything that we don't stop and acknowledge and have a conversation about. And one of the most beautiful things that can come as the result of you being on this webinar is whether or not your coworkers are on it or not, you already now have the ability tomorrow, this afternoon, next week to say, hey, you know what? I was on a webinar about compassion fatigue the other day and here's what I learned. So that that can all of a sudden open up the conversation. And you better believe the conversation needs to be open. The conversation in Lab Animal as it relates to compassion fatigue has been squelched for a very long time and lots of things are changing and that makes me so happy but we need to do more work here. We need to keep talking about this and normalize compassion fatigue in lab animal because it is a normal consequence of caring. You must understand that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you if you feel compassion fatigue. There's nothing wrong with you. So let's take this a little bit further. Now, if you notice, again, I'm on the right-hand side of this equation here. Um, underneath compassion fatigue, there are two components that feed into it. One is burnout and the other is secondary trauma. So let me define burnout for you because sometimes we use those terms interchangeably. And, you know, for in the larger scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. But um, in my work, it does matter because it's important for me to be able to distinguish the difference. But burnout is a workplace specific issue. It occurs when the work exceeds the resources. It occurs when we ask people to do too much with too little. And that could be we're asking them to take care of too many animals with not enough staff or not enough time or not enough space. Um, too much and too little. There's no trauma component at all. And with burnout, you can actually cure it, quote unquote, by having a few days off. But compassion fatigue is more about you and how you are relating to the work and a weekend or a long weekend or a vacation does not cure it. So I want to mention that the differentiation between burnout and compassion fatigue. And the other thing, like we've already talked about, secondary trauma really does become another term for compassion fatigue. But one of the things that I thought would be interesting to show you the difference of is the difference between primary trauma and secondary trauma. And this image that I have here of the therapist, social worker, counselor, and the veteran or soldier, um, I thought really demonstrates it really well. So let's say that this soldier just came off of the battlefield and what, you know, what, however we wanna define that. Um, he, let's say that he was experiencing, he was being shot at, he came across an IED, maybe he you know, even lost part of, of his foot. That's primary trauma. The trauma happened directly to him. Now, she is listening to all of his stories. She is listening to him talk about his nightmares, his flashbacks, uh, his difficulties in relationships, how he can't sleep, how he has so much anxiety, how he's drinking too much. The impact that what he is telling her, the impact that that has on her is secondary trauma. She's being impacted because she's a human being who cares deeply about her client and his story is affecting her. She wasn't there, she didn't have an IED um, blow up near her, she wasn't being shot at. 
but the impact that his trauma has on her is secondary trauma. Again, that's compassion fatigue. I just wanted to show you a different way of thinking about it as well. And again, you are susceptible to both primary trauma and secondary trauma in the work that you do. All of us that work with animals have the ability to be primary, primarily traumatized as well as secondary. And not just that we work with animals. Um, many people in helping professions are susceptible to both. One more thing we must talk about, my friends, and that is this term called moral stress. What moral stress is, is just what it sounds like. It's when we're stressed morally. It's when things conflict with our own morals and beliefs. And I, I unfortunately have to tell you that uh, there is not one way to work with animals that you won't exhibit moral stress. And for sure, in research, you will exhibit moral stress. It is part and parcel of you know, our work. And um, we have to understand that it is real, that it impacts us. And for sure, so there may be times where you think studies are going on too long and you don't like to see what the ill effects are to the animals. There may be times like right now, if you're being directed to call healthy animals, that would be creating moral stress. You may have moral stress if you believe that an investigator um, is allowing their animals to suffer in your mind. You think that they're in pain and suffering. All of those things could be moral stress. It could be moral stress if you think that people make mistake, made a mistake and then that's having to cause the study to be redone. That's moral stress. So again, this is a very real topic. It, is, it needs to be recognized and we need to acknowledge that yes, this is part of our reality on the regular. And again, it is with every, I only work with people who work with animals, but it exists in veterinary medicine, it exists in animal welfare, it exists in conservation, um, you know, it exists everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about, um, oh, just any opportunity to look at a pig makes me happy. Um, I said this to you before, but I really wanna make sure that this resonates with you deeply. Compassion fatigue is a normal consequence of caring for other beings. If you didn't care, you wouldn't feel the effects of compassion fatigue. Psychopaths don't feel compassion fatigue. I can guarantee you of that. So again, you can use compassion fatigue to your benefit. What do I mean by that? You can see it as something that is showing you that something's out of balance in your life. And it, you can use it to show you that, oh, wow, you know what? This is a normal consequence of me being a person that cares deeply about those that I'm here to serve. And it doesn't have to be, it's not a character flaw, but it is showing me that I need to pay attention to myself and I need to make sure that I'm doing my due diligence to understand what my needs are and am I taking care of those needs? Here's where it gets tricky in your world. Where it gets tricky is a lot of what you all need is just sometimes to vent, to talk about what is happening, what your experience has been, what you know happened today at work, what's gonna be happening next week, and sometimes the heaviness in our heart about that. And what can happen is if you don't feel like you have people that you can talk to, if they don't understand your work, if they judge your work, if they have spent too much time looking at you know, the PETA website and they think that's what your work is all about, then it makes it really hard for you to get that support, right? And you can feel very invisible and you can feel very helpless and powerless and that's a terrible way to feel. And first of all, I want you to know that I see you, you are not invisible to me. You've never been invisible to me. Is For the, the, the amount of time that I've been working with the lab animal community, I see you loud and clear. Um, you may have heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. And that is, I have never come across such deeply caring people as I have come across in the lab animal community. And it always, it always punches me right in the gut, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, when I go and I work on site, uh, in, in some of these places and again it's just time and time and time I'm like punched in the gut by the level of compassion kindness humanity and and so that's why it is so important that we really understand what it is that we need to do to take care of ourselves and I will talk with you more about that in this webinar
Now, so far it's been a lot of doom and gloom. Holy smokes, I hope people didn't jump on the webinar and they think this is really depressing because <laughs> so far it has been depressing. I'm even feeling depressed. But it's not all depressing, is it? Heck no. Your professional quality of life is equal negative aspects as it is positive aspects. The negative aspects are what we call compassion fatigue. The positive aspects are what we call compassion satisfaction. Let me let you in on a huge secret. Your life is just like this too. We have equal parts good things and equal parts bad things. Equal parts amazing things that happen in our life, equal parts terrible things that happen in our life. It's 50-50. So yes, your professional quality of life is also 50-50. The problem is you have a brain that loves nothing more than to focus on the negative. So your brain is always over on the right-hand side and looking at all the 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 compassion fatigue and the negative aspects of the work and it forgets unless you deliberately direct it to the fact that there are amazing things that happen in your field and one of the ways to stay connected with that is to stay connected to your why why do you do this work what is it that motivated you to choose this work do you have an answer to that if you don't you must write this question down now and you must answer it for yourself later because it's important you have to stay connected to your why and if you lose sight of that no wonder you feel compassion fatigue because you've lost your way and it's okay we sometimes lose our way doesn't mean we can't re-find our way i get lost all the time sometimes i get lost in my house i walk into the kitchen i'm like why did i come in here <laughs> same thing right i have to remember my why why did i come in here same thing my friends so compassion satisfaction this is the pleasure that you derive from the work and it is just as robust as the things that bring you compassion fatigue you just have to look for it and like i said our brain is skewed to focus on the negative focus on the negative focus on the negative that's your brain without you putting forth any effort well you have to put forth some effort you must put forth some effort if you want to reverse compassion fatigue you have to put forth the effort of going, hey, what do I love about this? Where are we making a difference? How is my work helping? How are my efforts helping? How am I able to make an impact in this animal's life, in these people's lives, in my coworkers' lives, in my team's lives? All of it. You've got to be asking yourself those great questions like that. Now, when I ask, what do people love about this work? I'm telling you they come up with lots of answers. There is never a scarcity in the lab animal community about what people love about it. Oh my gosh, you love the animals, you love the enrichment, you love the people you work with, you love helping, you love the quality of care, you love the stewardship of the animals. So many of you monkey people love those monkeys. You love helping, you love the animals, you love the ability to make a difference, you love the variety of species that some of you work with, um, you love the impact that you're making, the ability to make a difference, and the contribution. And I hope you have tons of other things to add to this, because this is just a smattering of some of the answers that I've gotten to this question over the years. And yes, the, they, they come in in droves of what you all love about this. All right, so. We've talked about compassion fatigue. What? Let's go beyond it. Want to? Yeah, let's go beyond it. Let's go beyond it and talk about what do we need to do to protect ourselves. Now, I want to be really clear with you. I don't want to sell, um, I don't want to sell you a false bill of goods here. Uh, I think that when we work in any helping profession, and that is a profession where we're serving others, and, and you can define that however you want. Um, for those of you that work directly with animals, you are serving those animals. Um, when we are in a helping profession, I don't think you can go unscathed and not feel any level of compassion fatigue ever. I think it's part and parcel of what we sign up for by doing this work. But you can have very low levels of it that aren't negatively impacting you. And that's what I'm here to sell you, if you will. So here are the ways that I think are the most, um, most important things to focus on. I'm going to talk with you about managing your emotions. I'm going to talk with you about self-care and how it is a non-negotiable. And if you walk away with nothing else, I need you to embody that. I want to talk with you about the importance of social support and how you can have that even 
if it feels like, wait a minute, I don't, there's like nobody I can talk to about this, it feels like sometimes. And of course, I want to talk with you about what it means to manage stress effectively, because that's really important. So let's start where we start. My favorite topic, managing your emotions. All right. So the truth is this. I spent the vast majority of my life, at least the first four decades of my life, not knowing where my feelings came from. Because I didn't know where my feelings came from or because I thought that they were coming from things outside of me, I spent the majority of my life trying to numb myself, trying to change the way I felt emotionally by using things outside of myself. I starved myself. I developed anorexia. I then developed a binge eating disorder. I then um, developed alcohol uh, problems as well as drug problems, all because I was always trying to change my emotional state with things outside of me because I thought things outside of me were causing my emotional state. That's what we're taught, right? We're taught we can hurt each other's feelings. We're taught other people can make us mad. And my friends, none of those things are true. None of those things are true. So. We must talk about where our feelings actually come from. Now, like I said, most of us think that they come from the circumstances, things that are happening outside of us. The toilet paper aisle being empty, we think that is causing our anxiety. Or we think that having to cull healthy populations of animals is what's causing our sadness and grief. Or we think that COVID, the presence of it in the world and in our country, in your state or wherever you are, in your county, is causing your fear but circumstances do not cause your emotions. Circumstances instead trigger thoughts in your brain. Your thoughts in your brain are what cause your feelings. Things outside of you never cause your emotions, but we're not taught that. No, we were taught things like algebra, <laughs> which I'm not using, I don't know. I hope you guys are using algebra. I was taught trigonometry. I don't use that either. What I wished I was taught was, hey, Julie, hear where your feelings come from. That would have served me much better in my life, but I digress. So I know some of you are like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. So let's take euthanasia for an example. Again, because I work only with people who work with animals, euthanasia is a part of every, uh, every group of people I work with, whether it's veterinary medicine, whether it's animal welfare, and you guys. Euthanasia is part of that. So think about it, just here's the question. And I want you to think about euthanasia in the big sense, Not euthanasia at work, euthanasia of your own pets, for instance. Do you always feel sad as the result of a euthanasia? I want you to think about that. Now I asked this question to a gazillion audiences, so I already know what your answer is gonna be is you're gonna think about that and you're gonna say, well, wait a minute. No, actually I don't. Sometimes I actually feel relief, right? If an, Sometimes I might feel angry. Sometimes I might feel guilty. Sometimes I have felt compassion. Sometimes I have felt grief. Hmm, isn't that interesting? I felt differently as the result of euthanasias. Well, why is that? Because the euthanasia, the circumstance doesn't cause your feelings. It's what you think about that circumstance that causes your feelings. So in the where there is a euthanasia that results in you feeling relief, you had a thought along the lines of, oh, Thankfully, we can relieve him of his suffering. He's no longer in pain. Then you feel relief. When perhaps, and depending upon how you're thinking, if you are having to call healthy animals right now, the thought you're thinking about that will create your feelings. So you can choose to think, this is terrible. We shouldn't have to do this. And you can feel angry. Or you can choose to think, you know what? This is what we have to do to keep our people safe and, and healthy. And you can feel acceptance. So I will teach you a little bit more about that. I have a great tool for you. But what I wanna, what I'm, what I'm teaching you here is, is, this, is that your emotional state is never the result of things that are happening around you. It's always the result of your thinking. So you are always creating your emotions, always. There's never an exception to this. You're always creating your emotions good, bad, or indifferent. And I know sometimes we get mad when, when we find that out. We're like, wait a minute, because we want to blame other people for how we feel. But other people are never responsible for our emotions, ever. And that's, that's the best news I could offer you on, what is today, a Thursday, uh, on April 16th, 2020. The best news I can offer you is that you 
actually are in control. You're the creator of your emotions. Because if you think that somebody else is, holy smokes, have you disempowered yourself. And we don't want to do that. So let me teach you a little bit about positive psychology or cognitive psychology. So this model here is demonstrating how all of these things fit together, how our thoughts, feelings, and our actions all fit together. So what happens is circumstances are facts. They're things that we would all agree on. They're things that we could prove in a court of law. They're not subjective at all. They're literal facts. Those then trigger a thought in your brain. Your thoughts are literally a sentence that goes through your mind. Sometimes they go through so quickly you don't even know you had a thought. You have about 60,000 a day, so good luck trying to keep track of all of them. And good news, we don't need to keep track of all of them. We only need to keep track of the ones that are causing us emotional pain and distress. Because again, it's our thoughts that cause our feelings. What are feelings? They're emotions. They're literally physical representations of our thoughts. That's what our emotions are. And my goodness, the fact that nobody ever teaches us this is really unbelievable. And I think we're making some strides here. Hopefully some of you have kids that are being taught where their emotions come from because without knowledge of our emotional health, like we have no, like how are we supposed to have mental health if we don't even know where our emotions come from, right? And how to, how to literally change them when we want to. So your emotions then fuel how you behave. We all behave the way we behave because of how we feel. We all either act inact or react based on how we feel. Sometimes based on how we feel, let's say we feel sadness. Some of us might shut down. Some of us might become passive aggressive. Some of us might drink too much wine. Some of us might overeat. Some of us might skip our workout. Some of us might go for a workout. Again, we behave the way we do because of how we feel. And then our actions create results. And our results basically are what we see in the world, in our lives, based on our actions. So the take home message here is that we often can't control our circumstances. Usually those are things outside of our control. But from there down, the thoughts we can control, our feelings we therefore can control, our actions and our results. So stick with me. I'll show you a little bit more about what I'm talking about. But before I tell you that, I must teach you something else here. I must teach you that of those 60,000 thoughts you have per day, the majority are negative, the majority are repetitive, and most are not even true. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. And that, I think, is really important for you to know. Your brain is a thought-producing machine. That's what it does for a living. It spits out thoughts all day long, most without your permission. What I'm going to teach you is how to actually deliberately choose what to think and choose what to think on purpose. And this goes against the way we are on default. And here's why this is so important, because you have to understand that your thoughts are a choice. Your thoughts are changeable. Your thoughts are optional. Why they matter so much is because what you think determines your entire life. It determines how you feel, behave, and the results you get. There is nothing more important than paying attention to what you think and choosing if those are thoughts that are serving you. Are those thoughts that are working for you? But first, you have to figure out what it is that you're thinking. So we'll get to that as well. And once we know where our feelings come from, then that gives us some authority to say, well, wait a minute. What if I don't like the way I feel? Now, I for the majority of my life didn't like the way I felt. So what I would do is I would do just drugs or I would binge eat or I would drink alcohol. And I get it, we all laugh about those things. Well, we laugh about the alcohol, I get We're not really laughing about drugs, but we all like, ha ha, everybody's drinking so much right now during COVID and, um, and we kid ourselves into thinking that that actually makes us feel better. It will temporarily make you feel better, but I can guarantee you that the next day, all the problems that you have, the reasons why you were drinking, they'll still be there. Nothing has changed, right? So there's this temporary relief from the emotion, but we never get to get away from it um, completely. It's still there. So how do you actually change the way you feel? The way to actually change the way you feel is you've got to change what you're thinking, thought by thought, sentence by sentence. That's what it means 
to manage your emotions is essentially you're managing your mind, you're managing your thinking. So let me do some funky graphics here. I'm going to flip this model um, on its side. <laughs> I know, it's like high tech people. <laughs> I hope it translated well. And I wanna show you, I have a great tool for you. This is, this is part of the worksheet that you're gonna be able to print out and use this and really start to get some authority over your mind, learn what it means to manage your mind and all of a sudden be able to have different perspectives than what you currently do. We human beings are like horses in a race, like a racehorse in a race. You know how they wear blinders so they can't even see alongside of them. So all they can see is straight ahead so that they don't get distracted. Well, our brains are like that. We think, our, our, our way of thinking, our perspective is very narrow most of the time. We think a lot alike people that we hang around with. We think like people we work with. We think like people we live with. So here is, this worksheet is called the Think, Feel, Act Cycle. Now, all I did was take that model that I was just showing you and I tipped it on its side. So stay with me here. So you'll notice the circumstance is now over here on the left. And what I'm giving you, if you follow along along the, the bottom axis, um, there is what you think, which then dictates how you feel, which then dictates how you act, right? And then going up along the side, there is negative thoughts, there is neutral, and then there is positive thoughts. So, um, and I'm gonna put in an example here. So my example is my circumstance is COVID-19. So when I start at the top, most of us always, you know, we have negative thoughts about most things. Again, this is, you'd want to use this worksheet for, you know, something you have a negative thought about. There's no point in using this worksheet about something that you're thinking in a positive way that's really working well for you. What I want to show you is the ability to be able to work with your thoughts and be able to consider and choose different thoughts and just play around with them a little bit. Think about your thoughts like a article of clothing where you can try different thoughts on and see if they seem believable to you or not. So my thought might be, I'm afraid myself or someone in my family is going to get sick. When I think that thought, how do I feel? I feel stressed. COVID isn't making me stressed. It's my thought about COVID that makes me stressed. And then how do I behave? What do I do when I feel stressed as it relates to COVID? I worry. I obsess about it. I tell other people what to do. I over drink. So then I ask myself, okay, in order for me to feel neutral about this, and I'll, I'm going to explain to you right now that neutral is actually an emotion. Did you know that? Like neutral is, I would say, closely aligned with acceptance. It's sort of this place where we don't have to love it, but we understand that it is what it is. So what would I have to think about COVID to feel neutral about it? Well, I could think, you know what, if, if one of us gets sick, I'll deal with it. So I kind of feel that sense of neutral or neutrality or acceptance. And then when I feel acceptance about COVID, how do I behave? Well, I get support and I, and I help other people if they get sick. And then how could, is it possible? Sometimes it isn't, but is it possible for me to have even a slightly positive thought about COVID? And if so, what would that look like? Well, I could think, you know what? There's an equal chance we don't get it. And I wanna tell you guys, this is true. Like we're, we're spending a lot of time worrying about getting it, right? But there's an equal probability we won't get it. We never allow our brain to go there. We like our brain to go to the worst case scenario. We forget that the best case scenario is in equal proportion or maybe even higher. So when I think that, then how do I feel? I feel hopeful. And then how do I behave? I protect myself right? I'm going to wear my PPE, of course. I'm going to manage my thinking and I'm going to live my life. Here's another example. The circumstance, again, the circumstance is factual. So calling 250 healthy animals today, my negative thought is I shouldn't have to do this. This is wrong. When I think that thought, how do I feel? I feel angry. And then how do I behave? I'm passive aggressive to people. I shut down. I'm over drinking. What would I have to think to feel neutral? Well, I can think, you know what? This is what we have to do to help protect ourselves, to protect the people so that they're not coming in here because we have to, um, you know, decrease our staff. And again, I feel neutral. I'm not asking me to feel great about this, right? There are times where neutral is all we're ever going to be able to get to. But I can tell you this, going from angry to neutral is a step uh, up 
if you will, in the way that we feel. Neutral feels better than anger. And then look what happens to how I behave. I talk about it to other people, maybe that I work with. Maybe I text somebody, maybe I FaceTime somebody, maybe I just send an email to somebody that I work with. Maybe I go for a run. And then is it possible to think a positive thought? Well, here's one. And actually, I didn't come up with this. Somebody in my course, my online course, came up with this one yesterday. Uh, their positive thought was, I can do it, I can do it with love and caring. Like that's all I can control here. So I know that if this is what I have to do, I will do it by loving them and caring for them because that's who I am. And then how do I feel? I feel compassion. Then how do I behave? I journal about it. Yeah, I might even cry about it. And I might talk to someone about it. So I wanted to offer you this amazing resource because it just allows you, you can, any problem that you have, you can, again, you put in your circumstance and then you start plugging. And I, just the way that I showed you to work through this sheet, you start at the top. You put your negative thought, that negative emotion and how you behave. And then you kind of see if you, then you move through neutral. And if possible, you even move to um, a positive thought if that is available. And like I said, it's not always, but sometimes it is. But look at even what happened here. Like this is one of the most challenging situations. And um, look at what is still, we're able to come up with a different way of thinking about it. That is the power of having a human mind. That is the power of a prefrontal cortex, which allows us to go, you know what, wait a minute. You know, I know that my thoughts are a choice. My thoughts are changeable. And the way to sort of shift yourself is to always be asking yourself if there's another way you could possibly think about this. Like how else could I think about this situation? One of my favorite quotes is right here. The greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. That right there is a the privilege of being a human. We can do that. But it takes work and effort. It doesn't come naturally, my friends. It doesn't, your brain won't just offer you up roses and rainbow thoughts. It won't, you have to work for them. You have to deliberately ask yourself, how else could I look at this situation? Your brain will automatically pretty much offer you a negative thought, always. I and mean, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. I've been doing thought work for 10 years. My brain still offers me a negative thought. It's okay. That's how it's hardwired. All right, let's move on to non-negotiable self-care. Yes, 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 yes. This is a non-negotiable. There's no way around it. The only way around it is to not do it and you will be exhausted and depleted and angry and resentful. And we don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. So please, let's make this a non-negotiable. Self-care is whatever you want it to be. It's anything that you do regularly, and there's a key word, regularly, regularly to help you reduce stress and enhance your well-being. It could be a practice. It could be an activity. It could be uh, an intention. But it really is about taking care of yourself. And it is your job. It is your absolute job to take good care of yourself and to make yourself a priority before you take care of anybody else. I can't impress upon you that enough. Stop putting yourself at the end of the list. We never get to the things on the end of the list. And then we wonder why we feel so depleted because we're not giving to ourselves. Your work takes an awful lot out of you. Your life takes an awful lot out of you. So many people rely on you. Why? Because you're amazing. That's why. Thank you. <laughs> so please replenish yourself, rejuvenate yourself, rekindle yourself on the regular, on the daily. And don't overthink it. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. I'm going to give you some this is not an exhaustive list because self-care is highly individual. So I'm just giving you some ideas here, but this is, you know, asking for help is self-care. I know what happens to many of us, especially us women. We just think that the whole world should see that we need help and we never ask. Please stop wanting other people to do what you want them to do. Just ask them, hey, can you help me? Here's the secret to marriage. Um, <laughs> The secret to marriage is, especially if you have a husband, um, I don't know how it works if you have a wife, but um, I don't have a wife. I just have a husband. But what I have found about husbands is that we sit around and we're so angry because they see us and we're, we're, we're doing all these things and we're sweating and we're cursing and, and we're flustered. And we're like, why won't he ask me if I need any help? 
because he's waiting for me to tell him exactly what I need. Because when I say, hey, John, can you do X, Y, and Z? Do you know what he does? He does X, Y, and Z. But he doesn't think of it beforehand, nor is he going to anticipate that I need him to do it. So the secret to marriage, and again, this is a bonus tip here in the webinar. Um, you're welcome. Is tell people exactly what you'd like them to do for you. And it doesn't even have to be a husband. This could be a wife, a partner. This could be somebody at work. Ask for help, for crying out loud. The most important thing I have learned for my mental health is to journal. What journaling means to me is about five or 10 minutes in the morning where I dump out my brain. I dump out the little things that are, these are so seemingly insignificant things that you wouldn't even think to write them down, but they're all rattling around in there. And you have to clean your brain out. This is mental hygiene. I can't impress upon you enough. If you do one thing based on this webinar, I, I want it to be journaling. I, that's what I want it to be. So there's my wish. Being creative, whatever that means, using the other part of your brain. Science uses, I forget, the right side of our brain. I don't know. Being creative uses the left side of our brain. Or if I'm mixed up, reverse it. Who cares? Um, but use the other part of your brain. Be creative in whatever that means for you. There's so many ways to be creative today. Are you kidding me? There's technology we can be creative. We can be creative with arts. We can be creative in, you know, with food and in the kitchen. There's so many ways to be creative in the garden. Come on. But find those outlets. Having a gratitude practice. Well, here would be a shortcut to happiness. I'm not going to lie. Um, and this can be part of your journaling practice. You can then also write down every single day three things that you're grateful for and don't allow any repeats and i gotta be honest with you right now during a pandemic would be the most amazing time to start a gratitude practice you want to you want to be rebellious to the virus which is what i'm all about you start looking for all the things that you're grateful for even in a time like this and you're going to blow your own mind and on the other side of the pandemic you are going to be so much better off for having also focused on the things that you're appreciative of in this time. Our brain naturally wants to go to, you know, um, all the terrible things that are happening right now. I get that. But give equal time to great things, things that you're appreciative of, things that, that are good um, and that, again, that you're grateful for. All right, nature. Holy smokes. Um, I can't say enough. Um, there isn't enough words to express how nature will soothe your soul and especially as it relates to your emotional um the emotional parts of you and especially as it relates to compassion fatigue just going out and being in nature if that's the woods the lake the beach um the park i don't care where it is again wear your ppe practice social distancing of course but get out there and be with nature nature wants to bring you back down nature wants to soothe you nature wants to reprogram you from all of the technology and the wi-fi and all the other stuff that's pulling us out of ourselves nature is waiting for you nature definitely wants to heal you hey these are some basics guys but i mean we can't we cannot ignore the basics and that is about being rested about staying hydrated and about fueling our body most of the time with real food moving our body in any way that feels good to you. I don't care what it is, but moving your body. We're meant to move. Be diligent about it. Meditation. Oh my goodness. The research behind the benefits of meditation is mind boggling. There are so many apps to help us. Three minutes of meditation per day will change you. You don't need a lot of time really for any of these things I'm talking about here. Working with a coach or a therapist. Yes, I coach people privately, but even again, a therapist, somebody that you can talk to. Um, and it can be challenging. I know, I know many of your companies have EAPs and I know it's challenging because um, they sometimes don't get your work and that can be a problem. Um, I, I know that. I know that that can be a problem sometimes. So find somebody who does get you, who does understand your work. They don't have to explain yourself all the time. They don't have to have people that, that can hold what I call neutral space. That's what I do as a coach is I hold neutral space. Like I don't, I don't get affected by anything that anybody tells me because that's not my job. My job is to hold a neutral space and all of that. So find somebody to work with. And lastly is literally about making time to feel your feelings. And you know, all that requires, like you could do that in any of these things that I talked about. Like all of these things on the list would allow you some time to feel your feelings. 
But what ends up happening is we're afraid of our emotions and we want to resist them and we want to hide from them and we want to um, ignore them and we don't want to slow down. But the universe is slowing us the heck down right now, is it not? And this is a wonderful time to get a little practice of what it feels like to actually feel our emotions. Let me give you a little insight. Most emotions last 90 seconds. That's right, 90 seconds if we don't, if we actually allow them, if we actually allow them. Moving on to the next thing, social support. This is fascinating, check this out. We know that when emotional exhaustion increases in our work, that our job satisfaction decreases. Now that might be common sense to you. You might be like, yeah, I kind of knew that. But check out what happens here. Look at what happens when we also introduce social support in the middle. Then as our emotional exhaustion increases, our job satisfaction also increases just by the mere presence of social support. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, Julie, what is social support? What's fascinating about social support is that there's like three, three components to it. First, there's perceived support. Do I, do I, is my perception that I'm supported at work? And let's just even talk about work or even at home or in my life. Like, do I have the perception that there's support there? Have I received support from people at work? Uh, my boss, my coworkers, somebody in my life. And then the social network aspect of support. Have I, do I have some social networks that are part of my life that understand that are in um, the research community that I feel like I can also rely on? So, you know, the statement down at the bottom, the perception and actuality that one is cared for has assistance available from other people and that one is part of a supportive social network. That is what we are all longing for. Like right there, spells it out. So how can we create more social support? You might be asking, well, I have some ideas. One of the first things is by having, you know, and I know lots of uh, institutions and, and um, organizations are starting up some compassion fatigue committees. I think that's brilliant. I love it. I think it's amazing. And I say, rock on with your bad self. Keep going. Keep going. Um, keep, you know, having a place, you know, just the fact that there's a committee, even if, even if the committee doesn't do a lot, just the fact that there is a committee already sends the message that compassion fatigue is important because there's a committee for it online forums, support groups. And again, those support groups are gonna have to be something that's probably very specific to your industry. Life coaching, of course, and therapy. Um, so being, being creative about maybe where you might be able to look for these, find these things, um, and, and how that might come about. All right, moving on, where are we? Oh yeah, last thing here, managing stress effectively. Okay, first let's talk about the stress cycle. Sorry that this is blurry. Uh, it's just the way this image is. So it's not your computer, it's not my computer. It's just the image when I blew it up. So we must talk about the stress cycle and how it is designed to work. Now, how the stress cycle is designed to work is that we are in homeostasis. Everything's just going along, you know, plodding along. Everything's normal. Our physiology is just you know, literally at homeostasis, just doing its thing, keeping everything chill. And then all of a sudden there's a perceived threat. Now, I wanna talk with you about the true stress cycle because the true stress cycle is that all of a sudden, and I was so funny, I was just out for a walk with my dogs. Where I live, we have black bears and there's been a black bear in the neighborhood and it's very cold here today. So I was wearing my winter coat and my winter coat that I wear when I walk my dogs is this black coat that has a big hood, has like a big furry hood on it and everything. And I was walking my dogs and where I live, I live on top of a very steep hill. And out of nowhere comes this woman on a bicycle, which I don't even know who she was. And it's a dead end, so I still don't know who she was. She maybe was a figment of my imagination for all I know, but um, I have quarantine brain, I think. And she says, oh my gosh. So she, she's riding by and she's, we had a you know, split second to chat. She goes, oh my gosh, when I came around, she goes, you scared me. I thought you were a bear. So the, the stress cycle, this is the way it's designed to work. We see a black bear. 
That's a perceived threat. Our body literally, our physiology goes into fight or flight. Our whole entire mind and body responds to the physical threat. Our entire mind and body shifts. Our heart rate increases. Our digestion stops. Our cortisol and adrenaline levels shoot up. Our blood shunts to all of our extremities so we can run. That's what's supposed to happen. And then what's also supposed to happen is either we are killed by the black bear and then this is all over or the black bear runs away and we go back to homeostasis. That's the stress cycle the way it's designed to be. That's the stress cycle for 99% of beings on the planet. That's the stress cycle for animals. Now, when we talk about the stress cycle as it relates to humans, we have to interject a whole other piece to it because here's what happens the stress cycle with human beings. Most of the time there is no real threat. It's an imagined threat. And therefore, since it's an imagined threat, it's something in our mind, it's an email, it's the look somebody gives us, it's a text message, it's something we see on TV. That, Since that's an imagined threat, that again, doesn't go away, doesn't retreat, we then go into it from this image you can see, we go over to the right here into the state of chronic stress because we never actually complete the stress cycle. The zebra, once it gets away from the lion, its physiology knows that it's no longer in danger and all of that stuff, all of those changes that were made biochemically revert back to normal and it goes back to homeostasis. Us humans are never going back to homeostasis because we haven't done what's called complete the stress cycle because it wasn't a pers there wasn't a physical threat to begin with. It was all this imagined stuff. So what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is what it means to complete the stress cycle. And I take this from, um, and I, I didn't put this, I just remember, I didn't put this. If you want more information about the stress cycle, I highly recommend this amazing book. And I didn't put it in the handout, so write it down now. It's called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle by Emily Nagoski, PhD. And it's also her sister, Amelia Nagoski, DMA. Again, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. Fantastic book about um, stress. So what she teaches in here, what they teach in here is that there's two ways to complete the stress cycle. And again, remember our physiology, we're stuck in chronic stress because there was no lion and therefore it didn't retreat and we go back to homeostasis. We're now in chronic stress. So I'm gonna give you here in the last remaining minutes here, the top three ways to complete the stress cycle physically. Psychologically, I will tell you the way to complete the stress cycle is by changing your thinking, which I already taught you. But the three powerful ways to complete the stress cycle from a physical aspect is number one, through physical activity. This is the single most effective strategy for completing the stress cycle. It signals to your brain that you have survived the threat and that you are safe. And if you do physical activity in nature, there's also bonus points for that because nature has a relaxation and calming effect on us most of the time, unless you're running from a black bear. So that's number one. The second way to complete the stress cycle is with breath work. And there's a million different breathing techniques. Now these br breath work is most effective in low to moderate stress. You know, if you're being, you know, um, if you're having an anxiety attack, um, breath work normally isn't all that helpful then. But deep, slow breaths, and especially paying attention to the exhalation is the most important um, way to actually change your physiology with the breath. The 478 breathing technique is one of my favorites. It's a four count inhalation, a seven count hold, and then an eight count exhalation. And uh, that's um, Andrew Weil came up with uh, with that breathing technique. And it's just one of my favorites. I use it all of the time. I use it to help me sleep. I use it in stressful situations. I just love it. But again, there's a gazillion in one. So whatever, you know, pick one and practice it, practice it and practice it. And the last way to complete the stress cycle of these top three that I'm gonna offer you today is any positive social interaction. Again, something that's casual and friendly. And again, this can just be small talk. Um, right now, again, I get it, we're social distancing, but any way when you're having casual, friendly conversation, again, it's signaling to your physiology that the stress is over. 
So that could be in texting, it could be uh, waving to your neighbors, or like I do around here, if the UPS guy comes, I like run out to the front porch and you know, I almost accost him from six feet away. I'm like, hello, you're the first human I've seen other than my husband in a week. Um, oh, another than the lady who, the imaginary lady who's riding her bike in my neighborhood. All right, so how do we get the worksheets? You're probably wondering, here are the worksheets, there's where you go, that's the link at the bottom, rekindlesolutions.com forward slash ACS. Thank you, Animal Care Systems. Um, you'll get both of those worksheets. You can just download them, print them off, and um, we'll just show a couple pictures of pugs, why not? And here's all my contact information. I have a podcast. Um, and again, I have a mailing list. I send out a, a pretty inspiring email every Friday. And actually, I'm sending one out Monday and Fridays right now. But that's where I am. That's how you can get a hold of me. Uh, I am so appreciative of the time I had with you all today. And I just want to let you know that your work is deeply important to me. Uh, your work matters so much to me. It matters so much to this world. And now more than ever, it matters. Um, I know that you all will be collectively responsible to helping us fight this virus and finding cures and solutions and vaccines or whatever we're doing. Um, but it's not just not that. It's all of the work that you do that makes all of this so much better. So I know we were going to open up for our questions. Um, when Austin comes back on, and I know Thank that, you, yeah, 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 we've got uh, we've got about 10 to 12 questions from the audience. I'm gonna jump right into them, Miss Quires. The first question is It does seem like in our industry, administrators and upper management staff seem to not want to focus on compassion fatigue because it feels dangerous to draw attention to the negative impacts of animal research in general. What are practical, visible, specific ways for management and training staff to hold space for employees experiencing compassion fatigue and educate employees about it? Can institutions facilitate an environment that alleviates the emotional burden of our industry from our employees? Hmm. That is such a loaded question. Um, it's a great question, and I appreciate um, all that went into that question. And, and I, I already know I'm gonna disappoint you with my answer because I don't think, it's such a fabulous question that I feel as though my answer just won't. Um, here's what I think. I think that, and, and I think there was a lot in th that question is like, yeah, I think, you're, first of all, I agree with you. I think that the reason why we, why it's been ignored or just haven't been given much attention is because all of a sudden in that, somehow um, admits that we should feel ashamed or we should feel or there or that we're doing something wrong here. And so we have to get really clean in our thinking about that. We, we've got to really get clean to be like, you know what, like um, the work that we do here, like, yes, like animals, yes, the animals give their lives for us to be able to, you know, we take that responsibility really seriously in all of the ways that we do. And we have to keep our mind really clean about um, the way that we and are are looking at those that that part of what we think is something that we shouldn't even turn a light on. But it's it's just part of it's part of research. And I think that leadership though has the responsibility to really want to engage and allow people to be heard. Human beings want validation. Human beings always want, they just, we just want somebody to listen to us, to know what it feels like to be in our shoes. We simply want to know that somebody is listening. And that doesn't even mean that we're gonna be able to change all of the circumstances, because chances are we're not. Like we're, like we're, animals are going to be euthanized at the end of studies and their tissues are gonna be harvesting because that's where the answers are. And those things aren't gonna change and there's gonna be comorbidities the things that we're looking at none of those things are going to are going to change but when we're willing to just talk openly and honestly and have common humanity about yeah you know what like there are days that this just breaks my heart and 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 the more that leadership is willing to say hey you know what we hear you loud and clear and i know that this is a very small gesture but this afternoon there's an ice cream social in the cafeteria. Trust me, I get ice cream doesn't make it better, but it's acknowledging that people acknowledge 
that we're hurting and and that goes a long way with people so there we go thanks uh thanks miss choir i'll get to the next question as someone who worked as a nurse and now works as a veterinary technician i have been dealing with compassion fatigue for a very long time i just want to know if these techniques work for past traumas mm. Yeah, um, well, trauma, you know, if, if, if with true trauma, we, we really do have to pr probably, the way this person is describing it and um, being appreciative of um, probably their work, I'm going to guess they may need to work through some trauma, particularly maybe with a, with a trauma therapist. You know, they often say that the issues are in the tissues. One of the things that I do know is that a lot of these techniques and these things that we talk about can help to some degree. Are they, uh, you know, um, an end-all, be-all? No, but they are, they are beginnings. And all of these things that I talked about add up and start to make some shifts and some changes. And, um, and you can see for yourself how far you're able to get. And yes, there may come a time where you absolutely do need to work with somebody to sort of dig through that trauma and sort it out. But interestingly enough, just this what got brought up. I was coaching a veterinarian yesterday, and um, one of my one of my clients, and and one of the things that I, that she said that I thought was so interesting. This is I wrote it down. Her quote. She says she was talking about just dealing with these times, and she says I know how to deal with trauma, so I'm actually thriving. So she's been able to use her trauma to kind of propel her forward. And that's not to say that if somebody else isn't able to do that, that there's something wrong with them, not at all. It just means that sometimes our trauma, we're able to kind of use it as fuel perhaps to um, allow us to move through things. And again, like I said earlier, it all depends on the severity of trauma and your, your relationship to the trauma. We can't compare, two people could have experienced the same exact thing and yet they won't, um, they won't experience it the same way. On my podcast, I actually have two episodes that I did when I was talking about, um, you know, processing trauma. So I, I, I um, don't have the episodes right in front of me, but uh, I would encourage that person to perhaps listen to those, to that interview. Um, it's, oh, I actually do have it. It's episode 36 and 37, Trauma Traumatic Stress, uh, where I interview a veterinarian who's got some um, training in um, processing trauma. Thanks, Ms. Squires. Here's the next question. How can I help someone who is experiencing a burnout? Mm. Well, if it's truly burnout, and this question comes up a lot because we want to help other people because, of course, because we're like amazing, caring people. We don't just care about animals. We care about people, too. So if it is somebody who's experiencing burnout, um, which remember how I described that the one cure for that is just some time away is some time not doing, you know, the work anymore. Like a three day weekend can literally like be pretty curative as it relates to burnout. We just need to step away from the work, but if it's compassion fatigue, um, then I think kind of like how I opened up this webinar earlier is that's a great opportunity for you to say to this person, Hey, I was on this webinar yesterday and, you know, um, I wanted to share with you some of the information that I learned and, you know, and, and just being transparent, open and honest with someone to say, I don't know about you, but I know that I feel compassion fatigue and here's the way I'm exhibiting it. And, you know, do you ever, we can just have a, 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 a curious conversation with somebody in a safe space. You can't do that in a room full of people. You can't do that. And the other person may or may not feel comfortable enough to engage in the conversation, but. We always have the right, and dare I say, it's to to be to ask another person, "Hey, how are you doing? I'm concerned about you." Like, there's nothing wrong with doing that at all. I think it's a beautiful thing to do. Okay, Miss Squires, here's the next question. I feel bad when I'm talking to a colleague about culling mice, but she works with dogs. How can I explain to her that mice are just as important to me as dogs are to her? Or how could I explain it to anyone? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. And it's a beautiful question, too. Um, I thank the person for asking that question. You know, <clears throat> I'm going to answer that kind of, here's the way I would first answer it. Um, and this might 
kind of be not the answer that they expected is, you know what? The truth of the matter is, it's actually not important for somebody else to understand the way you feel about mice. Um, what's actually important to understand is the way you feel about mice. Um, that's what's more important. And it's okay if somebody else doesn't understand it. It's perfectly fine. Guess what? People don't understand the way I feel about pugs. It, it means nothing. I know the way I feel about pugs. I deeply love them. Some people think they're ugly. Some people hate dogs. It makes no difference to me. It takes nothing away from my ability to love them. So, um, so I'm going to answer it that way because I want to empower that person that I want to empower them that we think the, the, the reason we want other people to know, and we do this a lot, the reason we want them to know how much mice mean to us or how deeply we care about them when other people are willing to dismiss them is because we think we'll feel better if somebody is like, oh yeah, well, Julie, I know that you're like a mouse person. Um, I know that you know, you're all about the rodents. Um, but so we think we'll feel better. And what, what I hopefully, if I did my job here, what I showed you on this webinar is other people's reactions to things are never what make us feel better. It's your own thoughts that make you feel better. So I asked that person to, to you know, just not make it mean anything that the other person doesn't see mice the way they see dogs. It's perfectly fine. It's okay. Worry more. I guess be more concerned about the way you view them. That's the only thing that matters. Here's the next question, Ms. Squires. How can an employer prepare a new employee for compassion fatigue? I didn't even know about compassion fatigue until many months after starting in the research field and wish I was made aware of this from the beginning. Yeah, that is a very good question. Well, I think that does need to be part of our onboarding process. I think, you know, because it's, a, it's an occupational hazard. It's, it would be like, I'm going to guess, again, I've worked for many large corporations um, in my life, and every corporation that I work with, we have uh, sexual harassment training, we have OSHA training, we have what to do if there's a fire training. Like, this needs to be part of the onboarding process, and we need to give people a heads up that, you know, yeah, like this work can impact you, and 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 being willing to explore with them. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you, but yeah, you're going to witness things that are going to be challenging. And here are some things that you can do to take care of yourself. And we reemphasize what self-care is and why it's so important. And are you taking care of yourself? And, and then it can't just stop there. It then has to go to our leadership and our supervisors and managers and, and anybody in a leadership role. Are we constantly, because we can't say these things. We can't just spout out a lot of this and then not embody it in the way that we're, um, we're interacting with people. Like it has to be, your words matter, but your actions matter even more. You have to model it for people about what self-care means. Like on all levels, we have to model it for each other, the people we're working alongside of, the people that are reporting to us. Like we constantly have to be modeling self-care, mental health, and well-being, and what those things actually look like. And those are some changes that need to be made, for sure. Um, and we might have to really be creative in thinking about what that might look like in our individual situations. But, you know, we, like, this can't just be, oh, the only time I heard about compassion fatigue was in onboarding, and I've worked here for 10 years, and nobody's ever, like, even asked me about, you know, how am I doing, or my mental health, or, um, and, and and I want to say more about that. We get very, we're very stigmatized as it relates to mental health. Mental health is different than mental illness. I'm not asking you to diagnose people and ask them about their depression and their, you know, chronic anxiety. Mental health is, hey, how are you coping with your life? How are you coping with the stress of being a human in the world? That's mental health. It's not the absence of mental illness. It's about how we are relating to the world around us. The CDC defines mental health as the way we think, feel, and act and handle stress. That's a conversation we should be having with people every day. Okay, gotta take a deep breath and get myself all worked up here, Austin. <laughs> no worries, Ms. Squires. Here, here's the next question. I work for a CRO that seems to breed a lot of animals that they don't need because of poor management, and then I have to call them. 
I feel like quitting, but I don't think that is the answer. What can I do if I can't change management? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, therein lies the biggest question of all. Okay, so if you can't change your circumstance, you have to change your thinking. I know we don't like that answer. It's all you can change. If you can't, again, if you can, hey, everybody listening, if you can change your circumstances, then do it. If you can't, you have to change your, you have to change the way you're thinking about it. And in that, in that example, that to that person who asked that question, you must take that worksheet, that think, feel, act cycle, and you must play around with that, play around with that, play around with that, and see what you can come up with. And I'm going to guess in that worksheet, you're going to come up with probably just some thoughts that create a feeling of neutral for you. And that probably is going to be the best you're going to be able to do. But that is, again, a step up. That is a gift to yourself to get yourself out of anger and, and to a place just of neutral. And, and I want to say one last thing about neutral. Neutral is not indifference. I, I didn't say that before. It is not indifference at all. Neutral literally is really mostly aligned with acceptance. Okay, Ms. Squires, here's the next question. Everyone seems to be into meditation nowadays. What type of me meditation do you recommend or how can you get started? Is there something else to do as well? Um, <laughs> that, I love that. Everyone seems, I wish everyone was into meditation. If everyone was into meditation, we would have a very different world. But, um, Meditation, so I, there are many different kinds of meditation and I don't care what you choose. Uh, I actually practice mindfulness meditation and all, med so what meditation is, is we are taking the mind and we are putting it, we are focusing it on something. Some meditations you focus on a mantra, some um, meditations you focus on sound, some meditations you focus on a phrase uh, or, or a word. Um, mindfulness meditation, we focus on our breath. We literally Put our mind, because your mind's busy, and you can't stop it from thinking. It's a thought-producing machine. Remember, it's got 60,000 of those bad boys to offer you up every day, so it's got to be busy. doesn't want you to meditate, so you just have to give it a job. If you've ever had a puppy, it's the same thing. You know with a puppy. An unsupervised puppy is not a good thing. Your brain is like an unsupervised puppy, so you have to take the puppy and give it something to focus on, like a bone. So in meditation, specifically mindfulness meditation, what you're telling the brain to focus on, what you want the puppy to focus on is the breath. You watch the inhalation and the exhalation. You're just following that. And your mind will wander. You better believe it. And then when you catch your mind wandering, here's what you do. You bring it back to the breath again. Oh, you were thinking about, you know, where is it that um, hamsters run free in the world? And then you're like, why was I thinking about that? And then you catch yourself and you bring it back. So there are a million apps. Um, you can use guided meditations. I don't even, the, the question isn't what kind of meditation. The question is, when am I going to meditate? Thanks, Ms. Squires. Here's the next question. Can you give an example of what sort of stuff you could put in a journal? I can never figure out how to get started. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, and I love that question because I love that somebody took my advice and they're really thinking about that. A couple ways. Number one, um, what you could do is Google journal prompts. Uh, that will give you little questions that you could start. I don't do any of that. All I do is literally I just, what is on my mind today? Like every day it's always about what my day is going to be about. And I'm just like writing down, oh, I'm nervous about this webinar I have at two o'clock. I hope I don't say something stupid. <laughs> which I'm sure I have, but, you know, and it's just, it's my, it's basically almost like a stream of consciousness, but that may not be the way you want to journal. So if that's the case, again, Google journal prompts, which will just be like, and they'll just give you something like, you know, what are five things, um, you know, that what are five things or, or it might be a journal prompt, like who are five people no longer here that you'd love to have dinner with? And you just journal about all that. So great, so great. Um, one more question, Ms. Squires. Do you have any book recommendations, not necessarily about compassion fatigue, but about self-care, perhaps a step-by-step -step, step book? Um, I do have my favorite book. Let me, 
book over here. My favorite book about self-care will be this one right here. Um, <clears throat> I love it. The Art of Extreme Self-Care by Cheryl Richardson. Again, The Art of Extreme Self-Care by Cheryl Richardson. That's one of my all-time favorites. I go to it all of the time. Well, Ms. Squires, uh, thank you once again for your generous time today in the seminar. Thank you, Austin. You're a great host. The entire webinar will be freely available in the coming days on the Animal Care Systems website. Today's webinar was sponsored by Animal Care Systems and was in no way endorsed by ALAS. Each webinar in the series is produced independently by each company. A special thank you goes to Jay Campbell of Somark Innovations for his facilitation of the series. For details about upcoming webinars, visit the ACE Community Postings and ALAS LinkedIn page. And please join us again at noon this Tuesday, the 21st, for our next webinar about tree shrews and how to care for them during the pandemic. We wish everyone good health and enduring safety, and we hope during these uncertain times that you will keep up the good science.